Hello and welcome to the Surgical Spirit Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Haider Al-Hakim, the Third Eye Doctor. Pull up a chair and get ready for some candid and uncompromising discussion with experts, innovators, agitators, and influential people from every corner of health and well-being. From inside the hospital to at home in the kitchen, we're leaving no stone unturned in our quest to uncover the secrets of healthier, happier, more successful, and less stressful lives. Thank you so much for joining us, and without further ado, let's meet this episode's guest. Hello, Chizibel. How are you today? I'm great. I'm great. You can see I'm great. I'm smiling, which is a good thing. And it's not pretend smile. It's real smile. I'm not putting it on. I don't think I know how to put on a pretend smile. So... Um, yeah, I think your first, I mean, it's, 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 it's quite interesting because your first reaction is like big smile, big laugh. And, you know, it really um, sets the kind of energy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it's all about, you know, having you know, that positive outlook in life, no matter what is going on. I, I was actually saying this to, who was I saying this to? Oh, so my daughter started doing this, my nine-year-old, she started doing this. So on the way to school, she, was, uh, she started doing a, a documentary. She takes my phone, press record, and gets me talking. And um, I remember saying on the, on the way to school on Tuesday, you know, in her part two documentary, um, that we got to smile. Even if things are going rough and whatever, smile. Because when you smile, the energy that comes with that helps you deal with the challenges you're facing because you know smiling authentically from inside th- there is something you probably know the term for you probably you probably know the chemicals i don't know if it's um you know, what is it is it it's not no it's not adrenaline i don't know you know you know best yeah. you know, yeah. medical yeah. terms and so on and so forth you know what i'm trying to say here but i think that's the key thing that we should remember because um i did this experiment once you know and you know, decide to find out how our how our um how our actions when we go through certain things affects us. And I think I heard this on the podcast: is walk with your head down and see how you feel for five minutes, and then walk with your head up and see how you feel for five minutes. There's a big difference there mm-hmm. because when you put your head when your head down, you know head is heavier, you know, shoulders down and all that stuff, you feel a lot heavier. But when your head up, shoulders up, you feel a lot lighter and your outlook seems to be a lot more brighter and welcoming, you know. So I thought really this simple things, little things does really affect, you know, or have an impact on the way we carry ourselves in life. So um, yeah, yeah. And and where where did you get that from? This, you know, smiling and laughing? It was, um, where- you mean me as a person? Yeah. Interestingly, um, I've been that way since I was a kid. Funny enough, maybe some of my, you know, secondary school mates might see this podcast. My nickname in secondary school was Boy Smile. <laughs> because I just smile. I smile about everything. Um it doesn't mean that, um, you know, I don't get, you know, a frowny face if I'm unhappy or whatever, but my general outlook in life is one of a cheerful nature. And, um, you know, and I think it's one of the things that's helped me carry, you know, to carry some of the, or get through some of the challenges I've been through in life, you know, and um, just having that cheerful outlook. And today I'm still the same. I'm still boy smile. I still smile. But it's got to come from somewhere. Who, who gave you that cheerful I don't think it's, um, interestingly, um, I'm not trying to, well, not my parents, it's certainly not my parents. (laughs) (laughs) Dear, oh dear, yeah, fair enough. I credit, but it's not, it doesn't come from there. Um, Not that it does smile. Uh, I think it's something I developed over the years. Mm. Yeah, it's something I developed and it's still with me, became part of me and... It is me. And, you know, who were your role models, um, you know, during that time when, when, when you started it was realizing that smi- smiling was, uh, was a... It was my part. older brother. My older brother, he's late. He died at the age of 26. He's, um, I was 18 when he died. 
and he was one of the person, one of my major influencers in life at a very young age. As a matter of fact, he played the role of my father, of a father to me. Um, he taught me a number of things about life, how to perceive life, how to make decisions, you know, without anyone making decisions for me. I remember those things till today, you know, and those things have influenced me. I've kind of, I mean, there was a letter he wrote me and I don't know where that letter has gone to. And I kept that letter for a while. It just disappeared, you know, and there was some really, a lot of what I hear now from people who, uh, you call motivational speakers, you see them on Instagram or whatever. He said some of those things to me way back then, you know, in the you know, late 80s, you know, um, right up to 19, you know, 1990 when he, when he died. You know, so he was a major influence in my life. And I think, you know, that still, you know, carries me till this day. So I what, kind say, of, what kind of words did, did he write? was a wisdom you know and one of them was i repeated this to someone yesterday actually and he said to me um don't let anyone make a decision for you on how to live your life it's the decision you make if it's a good decision then god will bless you for that if it's not then so be it but then you learn from those um you know wrong decisions you've made and i've made some pretty you know, nasty decisions or well, wrong decisions that have had, uh, you know, negative impact on me. But then I learned from those things. So um, those are valuable lessons. And, you know, he taught me to be a man. He, he was the one that got me into the whole bodybuilding thing from a young age. So I followed his full step in that. The beard was him because he used to carry a beard. I, you know, still a reflection of that. Um, Women. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't a womanizer like he was. But um, yeah, he he. Um, I would say he taught me how to be um, a womanizer. No, that's not it. But he taught me to be confident when it came to talking to it because I used to be very shy when I was younger. He used to be really shy, you know. So he knocked all that out of me basically so he got used to rejection he got you used to the whole absolutely absolutely females rejecting you 95 <laughs> percent of the time i mean that's what i get anyway no no, no probably 99.99.9 percent okay. of the time <laughs> just joking on that one yeah. no you know you're right 99.9999 999 percent <laughs> yeah um, but um, yeah, he's um, he was a major influence in my life. I don't think I would say. I mean, I mean, who else would I say is a role model? There are people I look at what they do and see how I can learn from that. But I'm not going to say anybody else is. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to give that space to anybody else. So that's so. Crazy. So what 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 happened in that dynamics between your parents and your older brother that sort of made you gravitate towards your older brother? I think it's more of the culture thing. My dad was busy. He was busy working. He was traveling up and down. You know, my mother had her own business, you know, which she was focusing on. Of course, you know, raising children, big family, and so on and so forth. This was in Nigeria, was it, or here? Nigeria, yes, in Nigeria before I came back here. You know, so, um, so at that time, you know, my older brother, he was, um, he was in university then. You know, so um, he felt he had a role to play, you know, to make sure that I don't go down the, you know, whatever path that um, may not be good for me. And obviously, having lived through that himself, you know, um, the challenges he's had to, you know, deal with, with my parents, you know, it's always having a fallout here and there. You know, um, I, I think he felt that he also needed to guide me as the second boy you know down the line so i come from a big family we when we were eight in number uh six boys and two girls and that's the thing with you know that's a typical thing with my uh, african families most families back then they're usually big yeah I think yeah what, I think what made my family big was the fact that um there were a number of twins oh yeah, there were three sets of twins in the family. So probably if they didn't have if, if they didn't have those twins, we probably wouldn't be that much in number. Yeah. 
you are you a, are you a twin no, no, or no, no, no. I'm not a twin. I'm not a twin, and I'm glad I'm not a twin. And your older brother wasn't a twin either. He was a twin, yes. He was a twin with my older sister. He was a twin with my older sister, and then me, and then after me, the twins, and after the twins, there's a boy, and then after the tw- after the boy, there's a <laughs> the last set of twins. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Yeah. Did you get on with your older sister, twin to your older brother? Um, we, I will say. I respected her as my older sister, but as I grew older, we had our we had our challenges. We had our back and forth, and yeah. I think it's only more recently that um, yeah, only more recently that she probably started to respect me more. Yeah, because um, I'm not one to um, not speak up. Yeah, so I would challenge things that I feel needs to be spoken about. I would, if you're wrong, I'll tell you you're wrong. You know, some people may not have that confidence or boldness to say so, but um, I, I like to, you know, uh, speak up and speak my mind. We can have a dialogue and, you know, have common ground, fine. But if you want to impose your ideas on me without reason, that's not going to work. I like to reason things out with people. So, that was the kind of dynamics then, really. Yeah. But, um, and, and you know, within the actual, you know, your Nigerian family structure, was it sort of more maternally dominated or paternally dominated? Ooh. Usually it's paternal. It, it's, 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 um, it's mainly, it's usually paternal, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the, that's, I think that's the result of the culture, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's still the case till this moment, where the paternal side, even sometimes after death of the man in the family, mm. paternal side comes over to, you know, take over control. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So it's still. I, I think it's changing gradually, but um, it's still a major part of the culture. Yeah, I mean, in our dynamics, it's, uh, you know, the over, you know, the umbrella is paternal, but the actual me- mechanics, the day, the day to day mechanics is all maternally uh, controlled and dominated. Okay. Um, yeah, so society in general is paternal, but within, within the family, it's, it's maternal, you know, uh, which is an interesting dynamic. So if you had a, a, a dominating mother figure, you know, particularly on the um, male side, there tends to be a kind of animosity towards the feminine and um, definitely saw that. And yeah. that translated into a kind of rebellion against the, you know, older sister, particularly, mm-hmm. you know, because... Interestingly, interestingly, in my own family, it was the case because... Um... The maternal side, you know, you know, my mother was a much more influential person in the family. She was the loudest. She she was the you know she was the most feared. You know, you dare not, you know, mess with her. Yeah. Otherwise, she's got the get, final word. She's got the final word, and the final word is usually the. Whew, whew. Yes, <laughs> you, yes. You, you get you get the whip, you know. Yes. So because of that, you know, um, she was um, she was feared. Even my friends, you know, my friends will like when they come when they come to see me. Is your mother home? Is your mother home? Yeah. Like, no, no, no. The coast is clear. Come on now. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, you that, know, you know, the older systems were um, maternally dominated, and, and yeah. I mean, it works for smaller tribes and you know smaller numbers of people coming together but once you get into um, a larger system or, or a governmental system then the paternal takes over um, yeah. and you know that's that's the case in sort of big organizations and big corporations now there is this movement that they want more uh, a feminine drive within corporations and uh, organization whether that's going to succeed or not probably not because um you know, the driving organizational force is actually quite 
you know, not very maternal at all, not very empathic. And, uh, you, you know, you it, feel like, it doesn't do you, get things done. No, do, do you feel like, um, you know, I had this conversation with a female um, exec not too long ago. And, um, and, and she was frustrated because, yes, yeah, she was, you know, brought into the board, but not being given the responsibility or not being allowed to make those decisions. So typically, it appears she was just a figurehead. She was just um, there as a token. Token, yes. I, I, did, I mean, I find that to be the case. I don't know if that's something you've um, observed as well. Well, you see, I mean, I work within the caring profession and, you know, the caring profession is dominated by, um, you know, feminine trait individuals. So um, it's different. Uh, whereas business, I think business is um, very much cut and dry and, uh, you know, results based. So it's the market that judges. It is really. the market, yes. Yeah. And you know, it's... You know, it's not really a sort of a, a feminine or a, or, a, or a masculine thing. Uh, it's the market that judges. And, you know, in healthcare, you do need, you know, quite a empathic and compassionate and kind you individual. Get the, you get that from the, fem, in, from the female doctors and nurses. You know, really. Yeah, I mean, the temperaments are more likely, you know, uh, you know, to be the feminine temperament. Essentially, agreeableness, you know, that's the biggest temperament mm -hmm. uh, in terms of... Um, best ability in healthcare you know how how agreeable are you with your patient yes and you know the more agreeable i am with my patient the more likely for for there to be a bit more healing um, well, what, what determines that you know agreeability if i was, if I was temperament to... temperament it's a personality trait a it's a personality trait uh, you know um what what if you don't have that temperament that right temperament well i i think if most professional most medical professionals don't some do a lot I, do. I think the majority of healthcare professionals are very agreeable individuals mm -hmm. which is why there is this mismatch between management and um you know the healthcare professional because people in management tend to be a lot more disagreeable mm -hmm because that's how you get things done. You know, you just got to tell them, sorry, do this. We've got this deadline. We've got this target. Just get on with it. Um, whereas in, uh, in, in healthcare, yeah, you've just got to put your needs aside and uh, the needs of others trump your needs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what happens. I guess that's the reason why, um, you know, there's a high, you know, I don't know if I would say it's a high burnout ratio, you know, yeah, yeah. doctors and nurses, you know. Yeah, I mean, the more, you know, the more agreeable you are, the more resentful you become. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, I don't think there is a correlation between agreeableness and um, neuroticism, which is, you know, the negative uh, emotions associated with with uh, certain experiences um, but if you're high in neuroticism which is the negative emotion mm -hmm. and you're high in agreeableness you become very resentful and and angry and it turns into depression and withdrawal so that's you know that's a common dynamic there mm -hmm. whereas if you're very disagreeable and you're low in neuroticism, you tend to be a psychopath. <laughs> yeah, you know, typical psychopaths. I just are... I, hope, I hope we haven't got you know, a lot of those in the in the healthcare system. <laughs> well, look, I mean, look, if you're a surgeon and you're dealing with life and death situations, what you need is someone who's totally disagreeable and a person who's really no low on neuroticism and not thinking about negative thoughts and not thinking about you know the bad consequences of complications or getting things wrong getting things wrong and you have to be disagreeable you have to tell the patient no you need to do a b c and d and you, and, and you don't care what the um what what the you know patient thinks so to speak mm. it's interesting um i watched uh 
it's a it's a Ben Carson story. Uh, it's a pro, uh, movie called um, Gifted Hands. I don't know if you've seen it. Yeah. No, I haven't actually. No, I haven't seen it. Really, it's really good. It really, um, you know, brings out, you know, some of what you're talking about here. Because as a child, this guy was, um, you know, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't great. I'm not going to tell the story for people who probably want to watch the movie. But the long and short of it, that he turned out to be a great um, surgeon. He was a pediatric surgeon, and he performed one of the most complex um, Siamese twins um, separation you know but what you can see about him is that you know he has that you know empathy you know towards not just the patients but also to the parents of the patients you know because he deals with young people a lot yeah and um in this instance you know the way he you know um performed this operation. It took his time. It took his time. It took him months before he made the decision to carry the operation because it was a complex operation. And he was being pressured by other medical professionals to do this like right now. But I'm like, no, if I do it, and I don't know how to stop the bleeding if this happens. You know, um, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, take my time to really understand how to do it so that the, the, the babies don't bleed to death. You know, and I think that's, true care, true compassion to want to achieve the best result, not just for, you know, the babies, but also for the parents, because, because um, you know, he has said to them, they could lose one of the child, one of the babies, but his goal was to make sure that none of the babies die. And in the end, he was successful. Yeah, and it turns out that, um, you know, he, he served in, because it's a true life story, it's, he served in the Donald, Donald Trump's um, administration when Donald Trump was in office. So really good um, example of, um, you know, how compassion can go a long way to achieve the best results for, you know, um, patients. And I think the same will also, you know, um, you know, the same will also, you know, be the case in, in business as well. Because sometimes business can be so cutthroat, you know. Um, but um, when we think about, you know, who we're dealing with, whether it's in the office or whether it's our customers <laughs> and, or, or clients, you know, people buy people, as they always say, you know, and your personality, you know, your outlook in demonstrating whether you care for your, your, your customers or clients does go a long way and i found that really in you know a lot of the clients i've dealt with and a lot of the um, customers i've had over the years and people are just really do things with in business so you came from a, a business family actually no uh, well, oh i would say okay my dad wasn't a businessman he he was um i can call him a civil servant you know, you know he worked for he worked, um, you know, in um, in the private um, establishment. You know, um, was you know, age, you know, as his, um, it was a, uh, it was a factory that produces cement. You know, building, you know, materials was just cement. I didn't say cement, cement. You know, so um, yeah. he did. That. <laughs> I just want to make that clear in case my accent wasn't clear enough. <laughs> Mate, you don't even... Uh, just, yeah, that's fine. Siemens, yeah, yeah, Siemens, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so um, anyway, he did that, you know, and um, my mom was... Uh, you can say she was more the business person because, you know, she ran... You know, she had her own fashion, you know, business and, you know, a salon business. So um, where the business came from I think it was just my desire to be independent you know it was my desire to be independent you know not to be um decided for in the way I want to live my life and in the way I want to you know make my money because I see a lot of people go to work I think maybe the way my dad was working and he was you know being told to go here go there and all that stuff I didn't want to do that you know so I you know just you know, I say, develop myself to wanting to run my own business. And I started from a very young age. 
you know, right from school, you know, selling this and selling that, you know. What was the first thing you sold? Pencils. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, pencils, you know, souvenir pencils. My dad used to bring, you know, boxes of souvenir pencils home that no one, you know, loads of them. So, you know, I thought, make money from them. And that was the first thing I sold. I was in primary school. And then it went on, I went on to... What you buy with it? Just stuff to eat, snacks and all that stuff. <laughs> So, so you did invest it into more pencils. Oh, I and... didn't. No. Oh, yeah. I just used it for snacks. Yeah, yeah. What did I know at that time? I'm like, I'm making money. I didn't, I didn't make the pencils. Maybe if I had made the pencils myself, then I'll probably reinvest it and stuff like that. You know. Yeah. But I didn't, so I just used it. You know. But um, I I graduated from that to making um to making cards. You know, hand handmade cards. You know, I learned a bit of calligraphy, you know, to, you know, callig calligraphy writing. Some people may know that. And then I made some cards. So, yes, I did some reinvestment of the money I made from that. And then I graduated to making, you know, fish tanks, aquariums. I used to build aquariums. Like, yeah, I do have a trademark. Wait, it's, it's this finger. So I have a stitch on this finger when I was doing one of the, yeah. So, so that's how I kind of, you know, liked the idea of making my own money. And um, didn't want to settle to, you know, just be an employee for any business. You know, and when I left Nigeria, I was in university in Nigeria. When I left Nigeria, I didn't finish my university in Nigeria. I came over here and I wanted to, you know, carry on in that, you know, um, in that line. I wasn't sure what I was going to do when I came here. So I started by taking a number of courses here and there, learned how to use the computers, you know, and then you know, what course were you doing in Nigeria that that you left? I was studying. I was studying geography. Yeah, I was studying geography, and my, I, you know, my thought was I would probably work for one of the oil companies or something like that. As uh, you know, I was thinking seismography, you know, and all that stuff where you go test, you know, for this and that in the ground, you know. But um, yeah. It still didn't sit with me. I had a number of things I was thinking about doing, but, you know, it didn't work for me. But I thought, you know, okay, leave Nigeria, come over here. Follow um, your brother. Yeah, follow, you know, following that, you know, instinct that I was building, that was, that was put into me. And eventually I found myself, you know, doing what I'm doing now. I'm just cutting the long story short, you know, and, you know, I started with project management. I worked as a project manager, program manager, managing a number of projects. And it was while I was doing that, that I identified the power of risk. Because one of the things that was significant when managing projects is that you have to manage the risk in those projects. Because without the management of the risk in the projects, the project will fail. Because you have dependencies, you have constraints here and there. Some people in the field may know that when they look at project plans, we use Microsoft Project, you know, and then you have to manage the risk in those dependencies. And I thought, okay, so if risk is this powerful, then why is it not being done a whole lot more? You know, so I thought I was going to find, you know, see what's available there in terms of a course. I was in a project for BT at the time, and there was a guy there who had done some risk course. So I asked him and he introduced me to a course that I did. And that was it. I fell in love with risk. And then I understood who I was. I'm a risk taker. How does and that work? I mean, how, how, you know, how does looking at risk make you a risk taker? It made me understand that we are all risk takers because we are all looking for something. We all want something. We all have different paths to wanting to achieve what it is that we want out of life. You know, whether it's a career, whether it's a business and all that, you know. And when I understood the dynamics of risk, you know, and I understood that it's a very powerful force, you know, that enables us to get through life. Because there are multiple types of risk takers. So we've heard the term risk averse people. I call them, you know, um, you know, passive risk takers. So you have the active risk takers, you have the passive risk takers. Uh, your active risk takers are the ones who are, you know, you can say they're more aggressive, they're more outgoing, 
they're more fearless in terms of pursuing opportunities and investing in those opportunities. Whereas the passive ones are a lot more cautious about pursuing opportunities. They'll rather put their money in the bank and save it than invest in money. So I'm just using that as an example, you know, and, you know, this defines all of us in one way. So we, there's, we are we, we fall in one category or the other and yes there are times when you could be you could be a kind of in maybe of a hybrid you know you know risk taker where depending on the opportunity you want to invest but you want to know more before you invest you know so if you understand the dynamics of risk then you can you know kind of float between the two really and then in, in, in the world of, you know, investment, banking and so on and so forth, maybe you have them in the medical practice, you know, practice as well. I'm not sure if you do because obviously life is involved. You have material risk takers. Yes, actually, you would have them in the, in, in the, in the medical professional, the medical profession, because uh, um, just going back to the example of, um, you know, Ben Carson, the surgeon I was talking about in the movie, you know, I would say he's a material risk taker because he took on a complex surgery no other surgeon wanted to touch. You know? So you would have these dynamics of risk. And this is something that I've learned over the years. So from that time when I you know, took that first course, I carried on doing a lot of research. And again, it's not just research from the textbook point of view, it's really seeing how that affects life because really, Risk is everything. You can see that photo behind me, you know, it says risk is everything and the risk is you really, you know, and, and, and I say that to people because I've come to understand, if, you know, the, you know the, 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 um, that risk is, that we are risk, you know, and how we manage ourselves as risk determines whether we succeed in the achievement of the purpose we want to achieve in life. And the same goes for businesses as well. You know, how you manage yourself as the business of risk or the risk of business determines whether you achieve your purpose as a business or not, because your, your business is, is, is established for a reason. You know, and, and that reason you want to, you, you want to, you want to see that that reason, you know, um, materializes. But then there are steps you have to take. There are processes you have to follow. There are methodologies you have to follow, and things like that. There are not there. There are you know so complex you know complex assessments you know or analysis you have to carry out. You know depending on what the situation is. Yeah. And you've got a series of videos which sort of goes through that. Um... Yes, yes, I do, I do have some. I do have some of that out there, and this is also part of the type of work I do for the clients I work with, you know, is carrying out these different um, analysis and also educating them as well, because we've been wired, we've been wired to think that risk is about managing the, you know, or, or preventing or avoiding the what could go wrong. You know, I mean, as humans, we've come to understand that word to be, you know, something bad, a danger, avoid it. You know, but what people don't understand is that Risk is just the umbrella. It's just the canopy, you know, of that umbrella. You know, under the umbrella, when you when it's raining, you have those pillars, those frames, those metallic frames on there. This is the same thing with risk, you know. And under the umbrella of risk, you have four variants, and those four variants are your potential problems, which we call threats, and they are the problems you are facing now, which is real time. And then you have the potential opportunities, which you don't have now. It's like having gold in the buried in the garden. You can't call yourself a millionaire, you know, because you've got gold in the ground. It doesn't mean anything to you. You can die, you know, poor with gold in your garden, but you have to do the work to get the gold out, sell it, and it becomes the number four variant of risk, which is the reward that pays you, that you know, adds value to you in some way. And these are the dynamics of risk, but. You know, a lot of people tend to focus more on the negative. And the question I always ask is, when you focus on the avoidance, they try to prevent the what if could go wrong, what are you missing out on in terms of the opportunities? And this is the way we need to think risk. This is the way we need to move forward in our thinking and understanding of risk. And this how, is how, I... how, 
how how can we shift from you know the thinking about what could go wrong and going towards thinking about all the opportunities available dr Hader, you and i know people profit from fear fear i said i said you and i know a lot of people and businesses profit oh. from the fear the propaganda of fear of what could go wrong so it's going to be a massive undertaking to change that mindset okay yeah but the way so it's an individual mindset, process i mean we're talking about individuals here rather individuals, than corporations you know businesses everyone really need to shift from that whole negative from that whole way of thinking about risk from that, that you know negative standpoint now if you think about this now okay i'm going to use covid as an example i'll be careful <laughs> what would you say cock, cock example <laughs> now, I, was, I was going to use covid as an example oh, covid i thought you said cock for a Stop second words in my mouth. Yeah, no. I've, I've never heard what the cock example is <laughs> no, no, no. covid example okay okay cool covid exam fair enough fair enough and you, you know with the whole you know news that was going on and so on and so forth you know a lot of people were you know made decisions based on you know the fear factor the fear of you know what can go wrong the fear of catching covid the fear of if i don't get the vaccine the fear of this you know, uh, people may, and you know, they're, they're right to make their decisions and, you know, everyone has a right to make decisions that for themselves, really. But is the decision made on facts or fiction? Is it because you are hearing it from, you know, major news channels that makes you think it's authentic? It's funny, I was reading this book yesterday. It's actually called, Super, it's, it's a great book. It's called Super, Forecast, Super Forecasting. Who is it and by? It's by, it's by Philip Tetlock and Dan Gardner. You know, and you know, in the book, it talks about how a lot of governments make decisions on data that has no factual backing. And people make money you have analysts that make money by peddling, you know, data, they come back up, you know, and you have governments, ministers, presidents, and organizations not, not fact checking, you know, data that they put out. You know, I'm going to read this line I did on the line. It says, many have become wealthy peddling forecasting of untested value to corporate executives, government officials, and ordinary people who would never think of swallowing medicine of unknown efficacy and safety, but who routinely pay for forecasts that are as dubious as elixirs sold from the back of a wagon. You know, and that's what you find today. You know, people make decisions because other people are shouting loud about do this, do that, it's good for you. Well, we are all individuals and we have brains of our own. So we got to, you know, do our own fact checking, really. You know, and this is what risk, you know, um, you know, is so all about. So providing hard facts, providing hard facts, getting the, the, the right information, the appropriate information allows you to go from, you know, the negative, fearful side of risk to the opportunity side of risk. You have to understand that, you know, you have to understand the dynamics. So, so think about it this way. Risk is all about achieving your purpose. And in the achievement on, of that purpose, there's negative and there are opportunities. There's a positive and there's a negative. So it's managing, it's about managing that dynamic. Yeah. So, but focusing on the negative prevents you from taking active steps in the realization of that opportunity, which is the achievement of the purpose you have defined for yourself at the start. And you have to ask yourself, okay, where am I in the roadmap in, you know, in that journey to achieving my purpose? Or, you know, the reason I've been established for, the reason I'm established for, you know? And, and, and that is what, you know, that is what 
we need to be moving away from, you know, the whole, you know, focus on that negative side to thinking about these various dynamics. And we need to think for ourselves. We don't need to just take what has been what, what we are being told. We need to do our own research. People don't want to read books. People don't want to, you know, do research. You know, Instagram has become the, you know, the point of, you know, you know, information, you know, Facebook, whatever. No one tends to want to read or you know, carry out, um, you know, research on. I mean, I, I do a lot of research you know, online. And when I do research, I look at, you know, various sources of information. I use academia, which is a great source of, um, you know, a, a resource that you can find information that you would you know, never think of finding, you know, on, um, you know, in the library. Yes, you can go to your library and get books, but there are many ways you can get informed yourself. And when you're informed, then you can make better decisions as individuals or as business owners or as medical practitioners, you know, as, you know, Dr. Ben Carson did because he read a lot of books before he performed that complex surgery. Mm -hmm. Um, What's the um, what's the riskiest thing you've ever done? Ooh, a lot of risky things. Riskiest, riskiest. Come on, you can tell. No, <laughs> no one's listening. No one's listening. Here. Are you sure no one's listening? Let's see. I'm, I'm, I'm shaking. Well, no one, no one's listening now because because <laughs> we're recording it. You know. I know. Um. Don't worry, your mother's not listening. Or, <laughs> or your big sister. I think, I think it's um it's what I'm doing now. It's what I'm doing now. It's, it's the riskiest thing because I, I, I don't know of anyone else trying to change, you know, um a, a strongly entrenched way of reasoning. Yeah, you know, so it's the riskiest thing I've, you know, um, I've done, I'm doing. And um, I mean, speaking to me is very risky. Yeah, that's probably one of the riskiest things well, you've done. So I far. Put, I, it's, not, it's, not high on, it's not high on the Richter scale. <laughs> <laughs> you feel comfortable. Huh? I feel comfortable, yes. You know? So this one takes me, this one makes me uncomfortable sometimes. But um, when you're uncomfortable, then you can find some chance to make yourself comfortable. And um, one of the things I'm doing, um, you know, soon is is a, is a conference. So I need to speak to you about that. So hopefully you might come and be a speaker on the conference. Risky. That's that's yeah. bloody risky, that is. Yeah. It, it is. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's, it's my second one. Um, so it's the um, Risk Takers Growth Conference coming up in October. And um, again, it's one of the avenues, one of the channels I am using to promote the, the value, the power of risk, exploiting the power of risk in your life and business. So there's going to be there are going to be various dynamics. So I'm hoping that um, you know we will make an impact, you know, a much more impact this time, and people will get to a lot more people globally will get to hear us. You know, when I say when I say to well, sometimes I, I think I'm crazy. I just say, you know what. I want in the next three to five years, I want when people hear the word risk, the next thing that they think about is me. You know, I think again, that's that's risky. But I just, you know, I just have to try, you know, whether I get to that point or not, it's a different question. But making an impact, I think we're all we're all put on this planet for for something. We need to make an impact, you know, and I want to make an impact, not just an impact, but a positive impact in the lives of people. I want to share information that will make people's lives, you know, more, you know, beneficial. You know, I want to do things that will enlighten people, maybe make them smile like me, you know? Yeah. A lot of, you know, glo- there's a lot of gloominess in, in the world. So, you know, let's, uh, let's, let's all, you know, cheer one another up, you know? I, I, was, at my, I was at my daughter's um, sports day today, you know, and, you know, I was like, Go, 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 go. You can win this. You can win this, you know. So let's cheer each other on, you know, because um, it's, if we don't, you know, we're all going to be a bunch of, you know, miserable, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I thought of a really nice word, but, you know, I've sort of, maybe on your conference, I'd use it. No, no, please, on the podcast. No, I don't use words like that. It was, yeah, it's full of risk, isn't it? It's all about risk. It is, yes, it is. 
know, and um, you know, it's in, it's interesting. I think we live uh, in in a really in, you know the time we're living right now in life is a very crucial one. Um, a lot of people are you know still feeling the impact of you know COVID. You know, in relation to um, you know the level of inflation that is you know um, you know affecting most people's lives right now. You know, people can't you know afford to fill their gas tanks up as they used to. You know, mm. and energy energy prices are going up. But you know, this must kind of get you get all your juices running and thinking. Oh my God, there's so much good opportunity yeah. here. You know. I mean, it, it does, yes, you know, but then there are people who are not able to, you know, rather than it, 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 it probably won't get their juices up, it probably gets it down and, you know, mm-hmm. people feel depressed, yeah. you know, and, you know, not knowing the way out, you know, so it, it, it's... I um, mean, in those situations, uh, you know, where, you know, the actual mindset is is um, totally different. Mm-hmm. Um what would you advise the man you know what would you do in those situations i mean you know here, here's you in nigeria studying uh geography and then and then what happened you you had this what epiphany or what it got you kind of it wasn't an epiphany i mean i was doing business already you know before i left nigeria i was you know a friend and i set up a, a consultancy it was the first company that we ever asked about. I was 22 at the time. And we, we were trying to secure contracts here and there. We we're trying this establishment. We we're trying this bank. We've got, we got a contract with a bank. The bank has gone out of, gone out of business now. We've got a contract with a bank to supply uh, to supply a number of things. They want us to supply uh, motorcycles that they will use for their courier services. And, um, you know, uh, and uh, we got that contract. We we're so excited, you know. There's a couple of thousands of Naira, you know, and we we're so excited. But then the problem was, how did we finance the the project? So I didn't have that kind of money. You know, so I went to ask my dad. My dad refused to fund it for me. I was like, I'm going to pay you back. You know, the value of the contract is so good that, you know, buy the stuff and then there will be profit and I'll pay you back. I'm like, no, go read your books. So that kind of got me, you know, in a tight situation. So I used one of his cars as collateral to go get <laughs> without telling him, of course. Without telling him, of course, without telling him. <laughs> so so that's pretty risky behavior. That's it was risky yeah. behavior, yeah. but you gotta take risk, you know. It was well wow. calculated at risk anyway. He never found out. He might hear this podcast and this will be the first time he knows about just, it. Just 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 send me his his email and I'll, <laughs> I'll uh... and then and then he'll say, right, son, I want a bit of your collateral. Uh, exactly. A bit of your equity of your company, please. Yeah, my company, son. exactly. Yeah. So I used his cash collateral and, um, you know, got a motorcycle, supplied it, you know, to the bank. Uh, unfortunately, they were not satisfied with the quality of this, the motorcycle we supplied. And then I was stuck again for the second time around because, like, okay, the next step would be to go out of town to go to an assembly plant and get it from them. But you know, if we're going to go out of town, they don't know us. We don't live in this town. So it's going to be a challenge to convince them to give it to us on, on loan. And that's how the project died. We went back to the bank and said, I'm sorry, we can't fulfill the, we can't fulfill the project. Maybe I wasn't that innovative then because we could have, maybe, you know, I don't know, gone to the bank, you know, I didn't have a business account at the time. You know, so maybe we could have gone to the bank to looking back in hindsight, maybe we could have gone to, gone to the bank and taken a letter and say, hey, we got this. Can you fund this? Probably. Who knows? But that yeah, but back. that failure, you know, gives you a lot of uh, thinking time. Yes, know, you know, a lot it does. Of re- reflection time. And yeah, and it, it, yeah. And I think that's what propelled me to, you know, I'll take the next step. And my next step then was to just leave Nigeria and come here and use my use the opportunity I have to come here and um do something greater so what was your um sort of biggest like failure moment here in the uk recently oh that's a good one that's a good one and that's a personal one i'm not going to go into much detail um but um i don't know if i'll call it a failure but it was my it was it was the breakdown of my marriage basically Mm -hmm. yeah it was that you know, because he, uh, he happened and he had a knock-on effect on a lot of things. 
Mm. You know, and when that happened, you know, I, you know, it was it happened at a time when okay, I was I was doing some work. I remember I was doing some work, so a project at that time for a bank, you know, but right. You know, I mean, it was it was a messy breakup and all that stuff. You know, I'm going to court, da da da. You know, but then right after that project, I struggled to get another project, to get on that you know another project. And my goodness, I don't know what was happening with all the experience I had. No project was coming, and oh my, that hit my pocket hard. You know, hit my pocket. People won't people won't talk about this thing. Everybody likes to look good and all that stuff and pretend as though they don't go through, you know, tough times. Listen, man, you know, tough times happens to everyone. You know, it's a normal fact of life. We should stop being ashamed of these things because it is shame. It, it is, you know, this kind of shame in you know, that holds a lot of people back. Shame about what happened, shame about life, really, because life has its dynamics. We need to embrace both the good and the bad the good, the ugly, embrace the all, is all the dynamics of life. And when you embrace the dynamics of life, then you can sail, you know, you know, like the Titanic, no, not the Titanic, that's, the, that's not a good example because the Titanic crashed. You can sail like one of those, um, you know, sailing boats that cross. Yeah, yeah, a bit like, um, um, what's it called, Sinbad's... Uh arc or um you know yes. the flying carpets <laughs> no uh, flying Arab... um, alibaba isn't it yeah yeah Al Al alibaba and the 70 thieves from seven, yeah yes you know no, is it alibaba and the 70 thieves or the seven seas maybe the seven seas mate you know <laughs> but you just float in the air you just flow you know yeah you can flow that whatever comes you take it you know so so yeah that was my challenge but you know what's interesting is that when when we developed the right mindset. And I think, you know, through experience of, you know, my mindset is being shaped, is being sharpened. And, you know, it's allowed me to deal with challenges in such a way that, you know, a lot of people struggle to deal with challenges. I take the good, the bad, the ugly, however it comes. And like I said in my book, said in my book, it's all data. What's yeah. the name of your book? My book is titled For the Love of Purpose. For the Love of Purpose, take these seven powerful steps to achieve your purpose. And I'm writing from experience, you know. So our failures are data that we can use to our advantage. I mean, think about it. Google. Why is Google in business? Because of data. We give Google data, they use our data. Why can't we use our own data? You know? So, and, and that's that's the thing. So that's why I say my mindset is shaped, is sharpened, is brushed up by my experience, good, you know, bad or ugly, you know? And I'm using that data in a book um, and I'm working on my second book and I've mapped out a number of book projects that would probably take me till I'm 60, you know? Because I love writing. You know, so we need to use our data, good, bad, or ugly, and do something with it. You know, profit ourselves one way, make other people's lives better. You know, so and you, you, you know, what 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 data did you get? What what information did you get from from that? From my experience, it's yeah, my is how to how to manage those challenges, how to mm. overcome, how to turn failure into opportunities that pays you. Mm. Yeah, because in those failures there are opportunities it doesn't matter what it is we throw away failures like crazy but there are opportunities in failure it's like going to the dumpster you know or you know whatever refuse dump there is you could find gold and that's the same thing with our lives we can have we can we, we can look at our lives and think oh my life is a dump no, it's not a dump. You know, there are opportunities in there. A friend of mine said something to me some time ago. There is a message in the mess. Yeah? So when there's a mess going on in your life, what is the message? 
is trying to teach you. And that's the thing. So I believe this is me. This is my own belief. I'm not quoting anybody, but I believe things like depression, you know, some, you know, psychological or, you know, you know, whatever can be dealt with. When we understand who we are as a person, understand that life has its good, the bad, the ugly, and it's all, that's what makes us who we are. You know, and we can overcome these things. We can overcome challenges. We can learn the dynamic, we can learn strategies for dealing with some of the, you know, uh, behavioral challenges we have around us, whether it's our one or whether it's that of other people. Uh, you probably know more than I don't know on this subject because I, you're, you're, you're qualified in that field anyway. Yeah, I mean, life's pretty fucked up. And, and, and all those... <laughs> Why do you have to use that language? <laughs> Well, it's just so direct, you know, it's when you say life is very challenging, people yeah. understand that. But when you say life is pretty fucked up, it's like, yes, I understand what that is. Okay, so what's, love. The <laughs> what's the difference between challenging and using that, that word? Well, it's just so more emotionally charged. <laughs> you know, there's more investment. There's more investment in that in word. The word. You know, challenging can be quite professional. It, Anyone can use it and it's and it's okay and it doesn't get anywhere. But if you say this is fucked, it has many meanings, but you can see it in the emotion. It's not it's not the kind of word I use. I try to stay more on the civil side. Well, yeah, I try to stay more on the, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, even know. even in our informal uh, conversations you know you are a very very civilized individual i must say i, I try i try I yeah try, I whereas try. i'm the opposite if i'm informal <laughs> i'm sort of on on the seaside on the seaside <laughs> yeah you know so um you know and and that's that that's really you know my experience and i i, I you know it's not been easy it's not been easy you know because i have to face you know deal with people every day you know, but I think what's helped me is that I, I'm, I'm clear on my direction. I don't think you like easy. I don't think you like easy. I think, you, you know, you'd get bored um, very quickly. I'll get bored easily, absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and that's why I like to keep myself busy. You know, I like to take on challenges. I like to... Yeah. You and, know. you know, you're a big individual. You're quite an intimidating individual physically. Am I? I don't think so. I think that I've got people... I mean, I like it. You know, I like... Because it, you know, it sort of it spurs me on to be more physically. I used to go to the gym. <laughs> yeah, 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 and 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 you know, I mean, we're coming towards the end. Who's your, who's your favorite bodybuilder? Oh, um, I don't have a favorite bodybuilder. See, everybody asks me the question: Who's my favorite? This, who's my favorite? That, what's my favorite food? And this and that. I don't have any favorite of anything. You know, I don't have a favorite food because I love all kinds of food. I don't have a favorite color because life is full of color. You know, we got to appreciate it all, you know. Um, but I would say, um, gosh, me. No, that's too crass. <laughs> yeah, that's that's too crass. I mean, Actually, I used to. I mean, Actually, I, I, like, I, like, I like the physique of um, Anthony Joshua. Yes, I like his build. He's not too muscly. He's not too, you know, whatever. He's a tall guy as well. So he's got a great um, great build. He's not a bodybuilder. He's a boxer. But, you know, um, yeah. his, his physique is, you know, it's, it's natural, I would say. It's a, it's a natural looking thing, you know, that, um, you know, I think anyone can aspire to be. Not the not the Ronnie Coleman type. The Ronnie Coleman. He's in a wheelchair now, from what I understand. Yeah, know. yeah, he's yeah, he's had a few operations for for yeah. his. I think he had some uh, spine operations. Injury, and, yes, yes. So, yeah. um, well, it, it's been a it's been a great pleasure speaking to you today. And you know, before we finish, you know, I like to ask this question: What would you tell, you know, the um. Uh, the Chizubel who's who's about to leave his course in Nigeria and come to the UK. What what would be your three top tips to him, having gone through what you've gone through? Define where you want to go to in life. Number one, you know, take some time, think, 
and define and be clear on your direction, what you want to achieve, what your purpose is. Be clear on that. I will give you the same advice my older brother gave me before he died is don't let anyone make a decision for you. Don't be influenced by, you know, the who and the this and that. Collect your data and use it to make your own decision. Number two, when you're clear on where you want to go, don't be shy on investing in yourself. Spend the time, spend the money. If it means you're locking yourself in a, up, up in, your, in your room for a whole year, cutting off from people, do that because I've done it. You know, take that time away from people. You know, take that time away from, you know, noise so that you can build your roadmap to you where you want to get to. And finally, don't be afraid to execute what you've put in place. Whether people are buying or not, you just need to make the noise, let people know. Just keep going, consistency, consistency, consistency. Keep going, keep going. And eventually you start to break that ice and people will get to recognize you and you get to offer the value or achieve what it is you want to achieve. So that'll be the three things I will you know, say to listeners. You know, I'm, Can I add a fourth one? Of course. Take risks. Yeah. Take risks. Yeah, Take. I mean, you know, with a with a beard like that, it's, it's <laughs> got to be a big risk. I love my beard. <laughs> <laughs> thank uh, you, Chisabel. It's been great. Uh, thank you, Doctor Heda. It's been um, it's been fun. It's been exciting. We always have great conversations, you know. So, thank you for having me on your show, the Surgical Podcast. You know, Surgical Spirit Podcast. Let me say that correctly. You know, it's amazing. And yeah, you want mine as well. So, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got the nice E sign on there. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's got the COVID sign, COVID tick on yeah, there. Well. Yes, we, we, we're COVID tagged, you know, because of our, you know, intense conversation around the subject, which you kind of, you know, did very well of to avoid going into details on. So that was fine. That was fun. That, that, that's, that's, you know, um, that's an achievement to be tagged, to recognize. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chisabel. Now, it's been a pleasure and I hope your listeners, you know, enjoy this. And um, I definitely recommend this book, The Super, Super Forecasting by, you know, um, Philip Tetlock and Dan Gardner. I hope you get a commission for that. I hope you get a commission oh, for that. No, I like to promote it, but don't forget to get my own book, for the love of purpose. Just type my name on Amazon and you'll see the book. For the up. love of purpose. For Take love care, Isabel. Yes, thank you so much.